Hello again and welcome to the Universal Blueprint channel where we are looking at our sacred history. Now we've reached a pivotal point in our timeline and it's it's interesting for me because it's one one step or a couple of generations in the grand scheme of everything we've already looked at. And we've already looked at hundreds of generations and individuals that uh, are part of the line and we will look at hundreds more. But it's just this singular section in our history's timeline that creates so much confusion and controversy. And unfortunately that confusion and controversy has rippled out into the modern day world and changed the outlook on spiritual development, the ability to try and understand the universe and its context and everything else as well and created them many political rifts, wars and everything else but uh, it's just a shame really because um, just to mention very quickly if for example Julius Caesar had survived the landscape would have been extremely different none of this would have happened um, at least that we know of and things would be greatly different but unfortunately we can't change the past things happened as the way they did and we have to do our best to try and understand them with the information we've got so what we will say is that obviously at the end of the day nobody really knows what happens if we did and wouldn't have this problem so in a way you have to bear with us in this channel as obviously um, there is a lot of information being gathered from various different sources such as um, Hancock, um, Ralph Ellis, um, Spencer H. Lewis, uh, all the hidden um, scrolls from the Hagmundi, oh, there's so many different places, a lot of my own research obviously, um, various other different people and everything else that's come together to make this um, idea, I say idea, this theorem of, of the most likely thing that happened in this situation. And we are of course obviously talking about the events from around 0 AD to 50 AD, which is the time of Christ or um, birth of Jesus. And because at the end of the day it's the most influential um event of this time and it does it is important the individual is important the people involved are important the knowledge being passed on and changed and um, applied at that time are important we cannot deny that and therefore we have to try and at least attempt to understand what really happened and what i've come to understand is that the events are so complex i mean at the time of what happened, there's a lot of different things congregating together, lots of different individuals, lots of different lines of knowledge, lots of different interactions. And even if we were to have it all written down, we're talking 2,000 years of history. Things change, things get lost, things get um, miscommunicated, etc. Even if we knew the truth back then, because it's so complex, the likelihood is that we'd still be confused today. And the fact that it's none of it's written down properly and kind of in a uniform manner means we've, we have little or to no chance of really understanding what happens. And we can say, you know, the Christians out there obviously, you know, use the Bible, which is their reference point, which is fair enough. That's, that's you know, their system of study, just like everybody else has something. But unfortunately, um, that, as we know, was written at least 500 years after the event, and by people that weren't around at the time, weren't even aware of what happened, and were basing it on different facts, and they cut and pasted various bits of information together to make a more unified story. Now, we're not going to go into that too much, we will get to that, that time period, but just be aware that the whole reason for the Bible's creation during the um, Byzantine and Constantine era was... Because Rome was fractured and divided by hundreds, if not thousands, of different Christian cults, beliefs, sects, all running around fighting one another, which were threatening to tear Rome apart. So in a decree of trying to unify them into one people to stop them killing each other and therefore destroying the empire, he simplified everything down into one simple teaching that we all had to follow. And that's where the Bible was formed. And unfortunately, the product of simplifying it down actually made it even worse and eventually the same thing would happen later on anyway. But for the time being, by the time was safe. So that kind of hits a bit of a snag. Now, you know, there's going to be people out there that won't be happy with what I'm going to write, but that's fine. It's not an issue. Um, it's an idea. It's a likely theory um, and it fits in with more information based on all the other different 
evidence that we've got, um, but most. And it's interesting if you want. I'm not going to include all those references and all those facts and information and, and research because I might as well just be rewriting the book or citing the whole book from each individual. But you know, you're talking 30 to 40 books at least that I've read on the subject to put into this and. In order to do that, I would need to just basically audible the entire book set to you, which is pointless. Um, so I'm just going to give the idea of the events, um, a rough kind of overview of what it is. and then, Because remember in this series, yes, we're following the bloodlines, which is important, but we already know that somehow we get from one place to another. Um, it's, it's the how, the why, and the where that is the, the confusion, but we already know that the individuals in play at the end were around, if not in the way that we think they are, but they were uh, in some capacity, and the people at the start were there also. So, in effect, we just don't know how they got there, but the fact is that we were still there at the end, so technically we can continue on our line, as it's only one or two generations missing. We're not talking about one individual um, 5,000 years ago being related to another individual 1,000 years ago and just jumping to that with no indication. We, we know these families exist. So, you know, um, it's not completely out the wind to just skip this section. But I thought I'll give it a go. I have tried a couple of times already. I will admit to try and explain it in a more comprehensive manner and failed. So this is my next attempt at that. So bear with me because it's a lot of information. It's very confusing, even when you've got it all kind of mapped out and written down and just trying to explain it in a comprehensive way is difficult. So bear with me. Okay, so we will begin by, and it's quite an interesting point really, that we're going to start with the story that does come around at this time, which is the nativity. Now I know what you might think, this is obviously not a historical event. No, but it's a poem. It's equivalent at the time to um, Homer's Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Golden Fleece. It's a poem, again, that was basically written 500 years after the fact to kind of simplify events to the point where it becomes a symbolic story as opposed to a real counting of a history. But I just want to take a few things into account. We're not going to go through the entire story in its detail. But essentially, um, the two individuals that were married were uh, Joseph and Mary, and they were told they were going to have a son who would be the king of kings, and they travelled on a donkey um, to Jerusalem, where uh, the innkeeper well, is technically Bethlehem, but it's in the kingdom of Jerusalem, and they were looking for somewhere to stay and have the child and they were turned away because all the inns were full um, and so they were given a stable on the edge of the city um, and then they had the child and it was visited by three wise men etc etc we all know the story so that's just remember that as we get to the end of this and this is going to be quite a long video there's no real way around it no real way of hiding that fact and it's still not as long as it needs to be to address the details so just keep that story very vaguely in mind as we continue on through this and we'll come back to it at the end and so we need to start our story and we've already overlapped here with some of the other videos because we need to just look at the entirety of events in context because if you're not sure what we're talking about then it's all going to go awry so the first person we need to talk about is Julius Caesar he was obviously the Roman Empire, descendant of all the four royal bloodlines and the ultimate king of kings within Rome. Now, he married Cleopatra, who was the queen, the bloodline of Ptolemy, who was from Alexander, who effectively was the ruler uh, by blood, right? Not necessarily actually in lands at that time, but they controlled Egypt and also technically because of the Macedonian Empire, Greece, Persia, Babylonia um, and everything in between that wasn't already ruled by the Romans, but as a symbol of office, Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were the highest ranking bloodlines of their time. They were kings above kings, queens above queens, and the name actually stuck with Cleopatra because that is part of what it was. She was considered the daughter of the gods, which is a thing we've seen continuously, but we need to understand that Julius Caesar was called the son of the gods because they were the royal bloodline that we've been monitoring all the way from the beginning of time since Toph. 
the pharaohs and the Hyksos pharaohs and the um, Akhenaten line. And again, you need to watch those videos to get that full understanding, so we're not going to go too far into it. But there is also another line that we mentioned, which is the one of Carthage. Now, Carthage's bloodline was destroyed in theory, at least the lands, not the people, and the bloodline by the Romans. And they were descendants um, through Queen Dido of the Phoenicians, who were also related to the Hyksos kings, just like um, the Romans were. Now, so we have those lines there, and this will all make sense as we go along, so you'll have to bear with me. And like I say, it's complex if you're trying to understand it from an easy point of view, let alone a new point of view than you people here are listening to so yeah just bear with me so Julius Caesar marries Cleopatra fine he attempts to unite the old bloodlines together and also unify the two great kingdoms one being of quality and smaller stature being Egypt and the other being larger which is Rome and the two parts of the king's bloodline put back together. Now, they have two children. One is called Caesarion, the other is called Thea Musa Arania. Now, Julius Caesar doesn't quite become the emperor. He gets killed by his rival. Now, his successor is Octavius. Now, Octavius is a member of Julius Caesar's family, but he only has three parts of the bloodline, not four. So he's second in line. He's, yes, he's important, his bloodline is important, but he's not quite the undisputed ruler Julius Caesar was. And therefore, Julius Caesar's children are technically a priority to the throne than Octavius. But at this time, Octavius and everybody else doesn't know about the two children of Julius Caesar. All he cares really about is the conquest of the lands in Egypt and expanding Rome. So he sends an individual, one of his generals, who he doesn't really like too much, called Mark Antony. He doesn't quite trust him. He figures, if I give him Egypt, then maybe I can trust him a bit more, make him a bit more loyal. Now, unfortunately, Mark Antony falls in love with Cleopatra and marries her. Octavius isn't happy with this, uh, and he orders him to marry his daughter. But he does marry his daughter, but he actually just has children with Cleopatra instead. And this angers Octavius. Now, the reason uh, Mark Antony does this is because he gets he realises, one, that there's children of Julius Caesar there, but also the importance of Egypt and Cleopatra. Something we'll see continuously here, where the Queen, because of the gifts they have and the knowledge they've been received through the family, the King making ritual, of the king the ability to perceive higher trance states they are higher functioning individuals they are above all mentally they're able to run their kingdom in ways that other rulers have just never even considered and so when mark antony marries into a family he sees this and he he basically gives his allegiance to cleopatra in egypt over rome and we see this again and again because it's 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 an important factor of the story but the, even though it's a patriarchal society and it's everyone just assumes that blood runs through kings and the kings of the kings and the queens are just there as a side thing. We already know that the queen's blood is just as important as the king's blood. It's two halves of a whole. In this period where Cleopatra's ruling um, and the blood's been intermingled with Ptolemy's because they're marrying sister to sister, sister, mother, brother, all that sort of thing as the Egyptians used to do because they're trying to keep the bloodline pure which is why she married Julius Caesar, then the Queen's blood is just as important. She has the same qualities of a king. She's ruling the country in the same way. It's, she's regarded as the moon and the goddess and a descendant of the heavens and everything else. And it's also important to mention at this point, because of the Egyptian theology and the use of Alexandria and Heliopolis and Edfu, there's quite a lot of connections between Judaism. They are not Jews, they just practice certain things that relate to them, such as the Kabbalah, um, the old Egyptian um, mythologies and practices and rituals, because they're in the Kabbalah and they're in Judaism. So the Romans just kind of label everybody as Jews at this point. So everybody technically in Egypt is a Jew, except they're not because they're doing all this other stuff. It's quite complex, but let's just leave that there for now because we will get into it later when we look at the next stages of this story. So 
We have Mark Antony then, who generally annoys the Emperor because he's neglected his daughter. So he's not happy with this. So what he does, he invades Egypt in order to take full control because he sees them splinching off from the Empire again. Cleopatra and Mark Antony kill themselves. Now this is likely because they actually hide Caesarion in the Temple of Helio Heliopolis. Um, however, we don't have anything further from that, but it's the most likely thing that they do. They substitute an individual out to be killed by Octavius because they're looking to kill the descendants of Julius Caesar because when he gets there, he finds out he's a child and he that threatens his throne, that threatens his empire and his family line because they have the better claim and he knows this. Octavius knows this. It's what's taught to him by his family. And so... He kills the fake Caesarion, Caesarion gets hidden, but then he takes capture because remember he doesn't have any, it's not, it's patriarchal, so he just assumes that because the male heir is gone, then that's all that matters. So when he talks about the other children, those of Mark Antony and the amuse who was from Julius Caesar, he doesn't kill them, he actually takes them away and he does different things and we will see that later. Now this is actually also interesting because Strabo and a couple of his teachers also advise in Rhodes because Octavius was um, a student of the Rhodian School of Philosophy, which was also part of Strabo's school and um, part of the line of Alexandria. It could be philosophically, but they actually cautioned him to not kill all of them and maybe saw to his opinion, said, look, you know, if we're only women, um, but just queens and princesses, you could use them like this to further the empire. So it's likely they had a hand to play in that decision as well, which is interesting because Strabo in the line of knowledge is also closely linked to a guard in Cleopatra's and Julius Caesar's bloodline. Okay, so with that in mind, we're now going to look at what happened to at least two, uh, importantly, two of the offspring of Cleopatra, one of them being... Um, the child of Julius Caesar, and the other one being that of um, Mark Antony. But we know of it could equally be Julius Caesar, but it's more likely to be Mark Antony given the time frame they were together. And so the first person we need to look at is potentially the easiest to explain, and that is the daughter called um, Cleopatra Selene, and we will refer to her as Selene for the entirety of this video because um, well it, it's just easier because of the names it, it just gets even more complex so if we call her Selene then we know who we're talking about so Octavius is having trouble in his empire because at the end of the day it's expanded so there's always going to be borders and people on borders are always going to be unhappy with their invading armies and so the main conflicts he has are to the north to the west and the east. The south is fairly stable at this point now with the conquering of Alexandria. And so the best thing for him to do, he has these princesses as a resource, as a, as a currency. Because they're princesses of Egypt, they have quality, even though he's, he basically denounced them and said, well, they're not daughters of Rome, so it doesn't really matter to us, but they're still princesses in the eyes of other kings. Um, and their children would therefore be inheritors of Egypt, uh, technically, of you know, to have good standing with Egypt. So, what he does is he takes Selene and he marries her to the Mauritanian king in Africa called Juba, who was around uh, about 50 BC to 23 AD. Now, he is the king of North Africa. Now this is again where this side starts to get complex because this individual is the ruler of Mauritania and in Mauritania there is a sudden development of culture. It seems to spring out of nowhere. Now the reason for this is so King Jubba is when we go back in our history and we look at the fall of Carthage. Now Carthage was destroyed in situ, but some of its people were allowed to live and they migrated down south. 
It's also likely, extremely likely, that the ruler of Carthage and the bloodline that was passed on also escaped south into Africa. And what we see then is once that city was destroyed, and we also see in Concordia that the teachings and religions are still being kept alive by the individuals even in Rome because they allow it as long as they're part of the Roman Empire so things like the sign of Tanit the cross and that we discussed in previous videos were all being practiced there and so the people began to rebuild and there's a, a massive kind of rebirth of a civilization in Mauritania and the reason for this is, is because those people moved south and started to rebuild in that area. So there were cities with towers and archways and extraordinary, not extraordinary, but high level civilization um, engineering for that time for those people. So for that to just suddenly appear would, would, would imply that these the rulers that were leading these people moved there. We also know that some of the House of David travelled to um, Africa at this time. Now, it's well documented that they suspect that a group of tribe of the Jews from Jerusalem at some point, either before or after this, um, travelled to South Africa because it's considered where the lost tribe of Israel went. But to be fair, it's the same time frame, so we don't know if it's before or after. But if they travelled, because if you've left your homeland in Persia um, and you can't go east because it's India, you can't go north because you've got all the Germanic tribes knocking about and your homeland is over in Egypt and Africa, you're going to travel that way. We already know that some of them ended up in Heliopolis with Achim, who we'll look at later. And so they travelled that way. And so if they keep having to travel because at the end of the day... They can't settle in Egypt either, really, the people, because it's the same thing as what happened last time with the Hebrews. So you keep going because you know that Carthage is there, so we keep going. So then it's like, well, Carthage is gone. So it's then they get to Mauritania. So it's extremely likely, if not certain, that Jubba, king of the Mauritanians, was a bloodline descendant of the House of David and the Carthaginian line married together to create a new civilization that now was pressing on the borders of Rome in a very short space of time. So in order to appease at Jubba, the king of Mauritania, he married, he offered the princess of Cleopatra, Selene, to say, well, we've given you this princess, you will one day own Egypt, your sons will own Egypt, and uh, now you don't need to attack Rome because you're in good stead with us, that kind of thing. So he was like, yes, okay, fine, that's no problem. So they had a marriage and became united, and very quickly, it wasn't Jubba that started to continue to rule the country and the empire of Mauritania, it was Cleopatra. So once again, just like Cleopatra and Mark Antony, this Cleopatra Selene became almost idealized by even the king and the people because she is the queen of egypt the royal bloodline the almighty queen of the gods and so they even changed their national flag their which is a symbol of pride we, that, you don't understand how important the flags are at this time it's their heritage and so they changed their flag to an image of the moon with the star above the star obviously being related to judaism but also the heavens uh, the moon was all to do with selene which means moon um but also it's it's like a title that cleopatra was it's all to do with the moon and the sun which we looked at through the pharaohs she was the goddess of the moon um and so under the heavens of the stars and it became um, in fact, their son, they had a son called Ptolemy of Mauritania. So this name, Ptolemy, obviously Cleopatra's bloodline. So why would the king, who has his own heritage, who has his own country, now change his country to the sign of Cleopatra and also name the child after Ptolemy? And so we start to get this theme that the queen is the almighty, the more powerful, the controlling figure because of her heritage of bloodline the knowledge she knows and the ability she's able to possess through the line as described and that's where we'll leave this for now so Ptolemy of Mauritania the child of Cleopatra Selene and Jubba who is probably the house um, descendant of 
House David as well, which is quite important to remember. So let's move to the other side of things. So now we have Thea Musa Arania, who was the daughter of Cleopatra and Julius Caesar, also seized by Octavius. So Thea Musa Arania also suffers a similar fate to Selene because, side note, two royal standards of Egypt, um, of Rome, the imperial standards, which are considered the most highest honour, because remember, Rome is the army, not the city, and the army represents everything that is the empire in Rome, and their standards represent everything that is the army, so they are like royal standards of Rome, and it goes back to even Napoleon times, when the eagle was considered like a massive prize, and was never lost in the army. Um, and two standards were lost. One was lost by Mark Antony, and another by a different general, and both of them t- over in the, the kingdom of Parthia, uh, over in, in the east. And it's the bordering nation of what was um, the Persian Empire, because um, when the decline of the Macedonians, Alexander, his other chief general that uh, didn't marry into the bloodline called Secluid, I think that's how you pronounce it, who, who created he was in charge of the um, famous cavalry of Alexander, first Greek cavalry there was, and he, um, it's what created the Seclud Wars at that time, and he eventually got surpassed by one of the old Persian family lines, um, Astacus, I think, it, it's not too important at this point, um, but he was ruling at the time. So he took over this part of the empire and began to attack Rome. And so Octavius himself, with his own army, went to reclaim the standards. And part of the trade agreement to do this was that he married um, Thea Musa Arania, the Egyptian princess, to um, the king of the time, which was Phraates IV of Parthia. Now, in order to say, you know, stop attacking Rome and give me these standards, that was the agreement. And it happened, so he married. Now, for Aetis IV, interestingly, we must note, had four wives already, four sons. So Thea Musa married as a fifth wife. But when Thea Musa became his wife, once again, she took over the country. She made him divorce his four wives, probably killed them, who knows, but also send the four stepsons from those wives to Rome as a gift of slavery or something to say, look, here, have them do what you want with them. It's a gift to Rome. The Roman emperor was like, yeah, fine, we'll take them, no problem. And that was the end of them. So she was removing the obstacle of competition from her own son for Aetis V, who was yet young. So... For a man that's quite happy to take multiple wives as part of their culture, now turns around and goes, no, I just want the one, the others can go, and I'll get rid of my children as well, is quite a massive turnaround. Ultimately, also, the people started to worship the amuser. And then she started adopting Egyptian culture into the Parthian Empire. Now just let that sink in for a moment, that is an extremely strange turn of events. And so we have this woman that just turns up or is given as an effectively slave princess and then becomes the queen of the empire in rapid succession. And also has a son with the king who becomes the legitimate heir and the people love it. They're like, yes, we will be Egypt, we will be the new Egypt and we will treat you as our gods and... um, rightful rulers even though you're a foreign lady because she's the queen she's the queen of egypt uh, effectively or princess of egypt and the bloodline and the abilities and the way she can run the country proves that she is the one above all just like the family is is better because the parthian rulers are the rulers but they're just rulers they're just people were in a good position with a better bloodline at the time and and do what they can but these people were trained from birth to and have the mental ability and the tools and the knowledge to um, rule the kingdom better than everybody else and that's why these great civilizations occur and so 
this happens. Now, the other part of this is, and this is where we get very complex at the time, so she starts to turn Parthia into the new Egypt. Now, we also have to remember that when Persia was dissolved, a lot of the community within Babylonia were essentially people that were left over from Jerusalem. So over that time, the people of Jerusalem would have um, had their culture of Judaism kind of embedded within the other people at the time so it's kind of in in there and quite a lot of the people there still hold on to their kind of jewish roots and therefore see that queen um Thea Musa is um obviously from egypt and talking about the kabbalah and all this sorts of stuff there you can relate to her and see her as their true ruler because it's part of the bloodline um and so she gains an instant following within a lot of the people in that area not all of them but a lot of the people that used to be from inside Babylonia, which is what we said about the House of David previously. This is quite important because, again, she is described as a Jew by the Romans, which isn't true because she's not a Jew. She's this new develops ideology of, of whatever it is we created at the time of Alexandria. It wasn't quite the hermetic side of things yet, but it was getting there. And so it was this thing that looked like Judaism, but wasn't. In fact, it's probably more of the Essene kind of context that we've been taught but because they can relate to the Jewish context you know they're just seen as being Jews again it's just a thing that happened unfortunately um, and so what happened was the amuser then didn't because she wanted her son to take power because he was a pure bloodline like her um, she poisons Freytas the fourth her husband and the people don't really care too much, to be fair, because they're happy with her and her son. The thing that tips them over the edge is that she marries her son. Sophia Musa marries her son, Paretes V. Now, this does cause problems, because in Parthia, the natives don't do that sort of thing. It's common in Egypt, and it's been common throughout the bloodlines to keep the bloodlines pure. That's what the Cleopatra family did, so to them it's just a thing that you do to carry on the bloodline because the bloodline is important because then they would have an even more pure blood child beneath them so the people uprise and they exile the amuser and for the V and they force them to leave uh, Parthia now the only place they can go is west once again so they try and go towards Jerusalem it's a common theme it's a common theme now it's said that they travelled with all of the cavalry who were obviously loyal to Alexandria's generals beforehand and their families and therefore understood that the amuser was their descendant and therefore were their royal guard and followed them. So they had a massive uh, army of cavalry, which is important at this point. They also had a lot of gold and a lot of money that was documented to be taken with them in the V. And they also had a couple of other children, either the, the children, that, um, it's more likely that because Ferretes had a couple of brothers and sisters, which we'll talk about later, they were already there with them as they travelled, as opposed to being born after because Ferretes the fourth had died. Um, unless they, were, they weren't actually his brothers and sisters, but children of Ferretes the fifth, we don't really know. But what we do know is these people were exiled west. Now, along the road, they go over to Jerusalem, and they seek shelter in Jerusalem. Now, at that time, the King Herod, a very important figure in our story, the King Herod is now the ruler of Jerusalem and Israel. He's also been given the lands of Egypt because Mark Antony had died. So Octavius had given him Egypt as well. So Herod... Um, and there's also a, a single point, as we know that as well at this time, but Herod was attacking Parthia. There was some, well, we know that, maybe not at that time, but there was definitely border disputes and invasions on either side, and the, the, the truce were very tenuous. Um, there was always fear of war, and uh, it was a very volatile situation between the Parthians and Jerusalem, Israel. So Herod obviously had that in mind. Now, when this large group of people because of all the followers that did come with um, Thea Musa and her son or slash husband uh, arrived in Jerusalem he was like well 
I don't want you because you used to be Parthians for a start and two, we just haven't got the room and I don't want you to be part of my kingdom because it's me, I'm the ruler and if you rule here then the chances are you'll supplant me. So he turned them away and said, look, we don't, we don't have anywhere for you. However, it was eventually decided because at the same time now, a new civilization appeared at exactly the same time between the borders of Jerusalem and Israel and Parthia it was on the border so what happened was that he said Herod said to the king and queen of Parthia but hate Parthians now you can have the lands on the border between the two countries as long as you fight against the Parthians protect Jerusalem as like a border control because you hate the Parthians, we hate the Parthians, and yeah, you know, why not? And you can have some land to do that. So they said, yeah, fine, okay, we will do that. Now, the other terms and conditions were, whether it was Herod's idea or their idea, is that there was a tax exemption. Now, this might seem very petty, but it's actually extremely important down the line. There was a tax exemption where they did not have to pay taxes to Herod or the emperor for their land. So they were the only people, the only country in the entirety of the Roman Empire that didn't pay any taxes. So they... But it was kind of a, okay, well, you can use that money to fight the Parthians then. So it was all kind of agreed and accepted. But this plays an important role in the story later on, so bear with me. Now, they settle a place called, uh, this place that just pops up out of nowhere on the maps, um, and the city is called um, Um El Gimal, or Gimal. It gets abbreviated to Gimal later. Now, that name means mother of Egypt. So this land that's just appeared quite literally appears and gives itself the title of mother of Egypt, named after Thea Musa, but has come because she wants to establish another new Egypt. She tried it in Parthia and failed, and now she's doing it again here. So she wants to build the new Egypt because she is the queen of Egypt. So I'm not quite sure how Herod was happy about that, or Octavius, because there's literally now a new kingdom saying we, we are the <laughs> rulers of Egypt and the queens of Egypt. So I'm not quite sure how they didn't really not want to take that over and get rid of it. But by the by. Um, but this place, because it's not paying taxes, and they do have this large cavalry, but because they're also part of the old Parthians, they don't seem to actually get attacked too much by either side. But they're also part of the Roman Empire, so they have the protection, uh, in theory, um, but also they're not paying taxes. So we get all the benefits of being in Rome without having any of the um, negatives. And so the civilization develops extremely quickly very very quickly we have great buildings a palace temples walls around the cities um, aqueducts all sorts of things in a very short couple of years um, and they start teaching what's described by the Romans as Judaism um, it's basically a CNA, a CNA stylism but it's, they have this already connection to Alexandria again because they're part of it so they'll be re-establishing new kingdom here and it's called um, El Gamal now um, the individual for it is the fifth uh, the amuser's son slash husband starts to take on a new name he's called Samaris because that's the rule of the people at this time but he's also described as uh, Judah Gimal, which basically means the Jew of Gimal. And interestingly enough, Gimal in Hebrew also means, as well as the mother of Egypt, it also means the camel, and the camel represents the line of knowledge between the heaven and earth in the Kabbalah, because it's the connection, it's basically heaven is what we're saying, it's the link to the heavens and the gods, and it's the seat of the gods, and that's the blood of the king and the queen, which is part of the... Olympians and the Hyksos and everything else before, it's all a symbolic meaning for one who has that special bloodline and a connection to the higher realms of understanding and mystery in the heavens. And it's all to do with the camel, which is the carries the burden from earth to, to 
the universe and the skies and the stars. Now, it's also so that this individual was a great magician and practiced uh, magics and the Kabbalah and all these different things, just like um, King Solomon did. And so he becomes this mythical, magical man uh, called um, Judah of Gimal. Um, but actually, in this location, at exactly the same time, we have a man called John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is almost certainly the same individual. And there's a lot of evidence to support that because of this new system. And we talked about John the Baptist in our previous video because he was given the gift of the Hermeticum, which was written by the individual of Hermes Trismegistus, which means Hermes three times great, which is a representation of the symbol of Toph turning into Hermes, turning into Hermes Trismegistus. So it's the third phase of human consciousness, but it's a collective works of the people at the time of Alexandria, combined and written by Philo and the others in order to compile all the knowledge into a new system and this system gets given to John the Baptist or for the fifth in this location where he starts spreading it and teaching it to his Jewish population in Gamal and it, it, it takes it's a new population um, it's already something they've practiced in any way to some degree with the Judaism uh, and the Egyptian side of things and they're expanding this new Egyptian empire in this location here um, and they're teaching this new stuff and he's performing these rituals in order to pave the way for someone else to come and change the world because we we talked about this in our last video it's the waiting for this change in the stars between um, Aries and Pisces for the eons but they're also waiting for a unified ruler it's the promise one the chosen king that's in all the biblical stories which will be um birthed at that time in that place and so and yeah so we start looking at these stories okay so we have these individuals now that are in this new location in a new city in a new country that's not taxed which has bloodlines to the kings and queens of old who has this army on, of, of um, horsemen who practice this form of Judaism which is the Essene they have ties to Mount Carmel and Egypt um, and yeah things get a little bit crazy at this time which is why it's so complex so let's move on a little bit because the more we go into it the harder it's going to be to um, explain and the longer the video will be now there is a, another aspect, okay, so for Aetis V, the new Judah of Gamal, the daughter, the, the son and also husband of Fia Musa, who is quite old now at this point, takes a new wife, whether that's because Fia Musa dies or um, she's just too old and it's time to marry, but they also need to start thinking about the future of this, so I don't know if they had children or not. Um, doesn't we don't get to that point there's no documentation of that so maybe they didn't but for eight is the fifth do, uh, sister julia orania named after fia musa orania and also julius caesar so we can start to see the connections there that's why this random person called julia orania appears in this location is because she's related to julius caesar the Musa Arania. They just picked two random names from the past out of the hat. It was all to do with the connections. Now, she gets married to her brother. Again, so we have the same context. It's going to happen before, it's not going to change. We're trying to consolidate the bloodlines. So, Julia Arania marries her brother, Praetis V, and they, or John the Baptist, and they have children. Now one of those children becomes the head of the priesthood of Heliopolis. Now he's called Joachim. Now Joachim is also the name of the priest line that was from the house of David from their priest line that was created the Heliopolis temple during the um, Ptolemy's initial reigns. And so the name, he, it's not going to be the same person because it's too many generations removed. So it's a descendant of, because that's why we use the same name. It's also kind of a title. So he is the bloodline of the um, House of David in terms of the priest line that we saw migrated. We also saw half of it migrated to Mauritania. So, but if you look at the histories, the 
the two lines are always connected. The priest line of, of the House of David and the king line of the House of David are always connected to whether they come back from the original line or if they're um, two brothers from an early generation, but they're still linked to the bloodline of the House of David. Um, so the child of Julia Arania and Paretes V, um, Joachim will marry into that line, combining that line. Now he also has uh, a daughter. Okay, so again, this is where it gets complex. So they've moved their son all the way over the Jerusalem kingdom to the other side of Egypt because, again, they need ties in Egypt, you see, because that's their country, the mother of Egypt. They're trying to, um, if you think tactically, if you have a country on one side of another country and you set up lands and, and allies and dictatorship in the other side, then you will eventually compress the two and take over the middle part, which is what we're trying to do with Jerusalem, Egypt and this place, and therefore reforge the kingdom along the south borders. And so they marry their children to the um, other house of David, which is in Heliopolis. So they're combining the bloodlines and they're combining Egypt and this mother of Egypt, this new land over near Parthia on the borders. And yeah, so he, this Joachim, but as the head of the temple of Heliopolis, the head priest, marries a woman called Anne of Heliopolis, hence the name. Now their child is called Mary. Here we go. So this Mary is considered the purest of the pure. She's an oracle, like the oracle at Delphi being in the Heliopolis temple. She is described as being the one connected to the heavens and the gods and able to have these visions. So she's part of that bloodline because she can do those things. Um, but she's considered the virgin, the pure, the clean, the dove, which is where the dove of Mary comes from when you look at the dove in all the kind of stained glass windows and depiction symbols of Mary in church, especially in Rome. That's what it represents. It's this individual, the dove. And, and so she's considered a virgin, but she also takes a husband, but the name sticks. So even though she's married, she still has the name the virgin which is where the Immaculate Conception idea comes from, because it's still Mary, but she's still a virgin, but she's got a husband, but she has a child. And so over 2,000 years of distortion, the story just gets wild. And But that's the truth. It's, it's Mary, the virgin, because she was still able to be untouched by physical society and um, your cleanness of the material world to access the higher planes of motion. It's not the virgin as in sexual, it's the virgin as in um, the purest of heart and, and everything else. So we have the Virgin Mary that takes a husband and he and she was the daughter of Joachim, who was the daughter of Julia Reign and Freitas V and was the head of the Temple of Heliopolis. Now, let's just go back a moment to Ptolemy of Mauritania. I told you this was complex. It's not a, it's not an easy, straightforward line to line here. And you see why, because they try to combine everybody together. So Ptolemy of Mauritania, who was the daughter of Cleopatra um, Selene, who married into the other line, the House of David and, and Carthage, um, then gets married to Julia Arania as well. So Julia Arania has two husbands, and we see this again in Egypt previously in the line of Cleopatra and Ptolemy, where they have two husbands, they have two lots of children, those two children then marry one another to unify bloodlines, but also to keep the bloodlines as pure as possible. So we have Ptolemy and Maritania, who comes over to Egypt and this new land in the south. So he travels all the way there, he gives up his country, effectively like he still runs it he still owns it he's still a leader but he left it to move all the way to Parthia to marry Julia Reina which shows how important that bloodline is because he's willing to do that to, to travel all that way and stay there and get married have kids and etc um because the chance of being in this bloodline is just it, it, it's just the highest of honors at that time and so Ptolemy of Mauritania has a child. Now that child is called Isas. Think about that for a second. Jesus, Isis. Um, and that king resides in this little land of Gimal, which we'll look at later on. And he marries Mary. Saint Mary, Mary. Which is the 
the high priestess of the Heliopolis, which effectively is still his family line because that's the grandchild of his stepfather and his mother. So by uniting Mary, which would be Mary Magdalene, and King Esas, which would be Jesus or Joseph, because his actual name was Joseph, son of Joseph, making Ptolemy of Mauritania, also called Joseph, because it's a title, because he would have took control of the king, like the lands there as well, of Parthia. Because John the Baptist becomes a high priest, or whatever, and starts teaching all this stuff, so he doesn't become the king anymore, he relinquishes it to um, his sister and her husband, Ptolemy and Maritamia, so they become the kings. Um, so he takes on the title of Joseph, and then he passes it on to his son, Joseph, Ben Joseph, who becomes Jesus, which is a new title, just like Caesar. Again, we'll look at that later on, but we're just trying to draw a skeleton here to base all the other stuff on later. So, King Esas, Joseph, Joseph, son of Joseph, Ben Joseph, is the step son of Phoretes V, John the Baptist. And his mother is called Julia Arania, or Helena, which she's also known as Helia the Virgin Mary as well, because Mary is also a title like Joseph. It becomes. A like a title, so Saint Mary Magdalene is probably also not called Mary as such, it's a title of Queen. Um, now interestingly enough we have another story, we'll go back to the original nativity story, but the other story is about, when we're, we're going to jump ahead a bit and go to the crucifixion of Christ, where there's three women sat at the base of uh, the cross when he dies and those three women are there's a young woman like a, a normal age woman and an old woman and they are the representation of the three marys then we three marys is the trinity because you have the young the kind of mature and then you have the old and the three marys represent mary magdalene his wife mary julia arania or helena or the virgin mary um we'll look at that in a second um is his mum, and then you have his grandmum, which is Thea Musa Arania, which is also given the title of Mary. So you have the three Marys, the old, the middle, and the young. Just like you have the three kings. You have him, you have his father, and then you have his uncle, John the Baptist. So there's a triplicity here again. Now, let's just look for a moment at the name. Let's go back to the story then. So we've, we've kind of covered what I needed to cover. And again, it might sound quite far-fetched, but that's the point. If it was easy, then we'd have already understood it by now. And there's a lot more to this. There's so much more. I'm just trying to kind of bring it down to a, a level that we can fit into this simplified video. Because it's all written down in my book as well. So if you want to grab a copy of that, that would actually help um, look at the other information for you. Um, but... So the story of the nativity. So we have Mary and Joseph who were told they were going to have a son that will rule the world. They do have a son. Phoretes V and Thea Musa Arania do have a son called Jesus technically because they, let's look at this, it's symbolic. Okay, so we're going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole. So symbolically, although they specifically don't have a son themselves because it's actually um, Julia Arania which, and um, Ptolemy of Meritamia which have the son of Jesus, it's Julia Arania that travels with her brother um, Praetors V and also her mother Thea Musa Arania from um, Parthia. Now they are the ones that travel so they are the ones that are having the child. They, as a plural, between them, are having the child that will rule the world, which would be Jesus. Because remember, like we said at the start, these stories are simplified in such a way that it just completely obliterates history and its context. Um, so they travel from Parthia, they're exiled from their home because we're told that Herod attacks the home and the people and they have to move. But actually it was Octavius um, that was invading the lands 
um, and Herod was probably a facilitator in that and attacking Parthia, but actually it was the people that uprose and kicked them out which made them exile and they were probably, um, like I say, expecting a child which was actually Jacob and Joachim um, of the temple which meant that they had to travel. Now they travel with a large cavalry on horseback to Jerusalem. Now the donkey represents the cavalry and the journey and the burden of um, taking all this civilization with them to this new location. So the donkey represents the carrying of burden. It could quite possible be, but actually it wasn't a donkey. The original story could have been a camel, which is what the name of the city is. It's Gimal Camel, which is also, like we said, about the, um, the link between heaven and earth and the ability to obviously um, carry the weight of responsibility of passing on the knowledge of the line. Um, and in effect, they do have a child because they set up a new civilization, and that is the birth of the child of civilization, the new civilization that will rule the world. Um, so it's the child is a symbolic version for an actual child, but also the civilization being born. Now let's look at the story. So these people, Joseph and Mary, which we'll look at in a minute, um, travel to Jerusalem on donkey back, which is the horse, the camel, the um, cavalry, the people, uh, and the burden, and through the knowledge of heaven, which is the camel, um, travel to Jerusalem. But when they get there, the innkeeper says there is no rooms at any of the inns. We go to all the inns and there's no, nothing there. But the innkeeper says, well, you can, you can go outside the city and live in a stable. So they've gone to Herod and said, we want to live here, but there's no room. Herod says there was no room, and he gives them land outside of the city, outside of Jerusalem, and says, you can stay there. So that's the same thing. It's just written in a different way. It's the Odysseus, the, the um, Odyssey's version of the events, in effect, that is symbolized. So, because they're not putting names to things, they don't want to do that because it creates issues with the Roman Empire. So, they're saying, we went to a town, there was no room, the innkeeper said you can stay at the edge of the city in a stable. Well, yeah, because you're given this scrap of land outside of Jerusalem and basically told to just go and live over there, which is what happens. And they give birth to a child, which is the new civilization. But they also have a child, which goes to Heliopolis. Now, the term Pasha represents the use of different names over different terms using the same idea. We, we looked at it in the passing of Horus and Osiris, and that kind of thing, where the same name is used. We looked at Mary and Joseph as a title rather than names. Now, if we look at Ptolemy of Mauritania as Joseph and Julia Rainier as Mary, and we also described that Thea Musa was a version of Mary, and so was Mary Magdalene. So instead of saying that there were three people called Mary, perhaps they got confused when they wrote the Bible, or they already knew and they just turned it into one person representing the three, a symbolic Mary, that represents all three. So Mary travelled from the homelands to Jerusalem, or Bethlehem, which she did, because Thea Musa travelled with Julia Rainier to Bethlehem. And that's Mary, which will be King Jesus' mother, which is Julia Rainier. So she will be the Virgin Mary. But the Virgin Mary was the daughter of Joachim and Heliopolis, who then married Jesus. So, But remember, the Virgin isn't an immaculate virgin. It's just the name of cleanliness, heavens, releasing of the burdens of material, the material reality. But she still got married and had children. But if you're linking the two together, you don't know which Mary is which, so it ends up being that Jesus' mum was a Mary that was a virgin, but also travelled from here. And so you've got three people all in one place, all doing the same thing. And then you get, well, if she was a virgin, she got married and she had kids, but she was still a virgin, and she must have been the Immaculate Conception. Right, well, actually, no, it's just a title, but it's a different Mary, and it's still just a title because it was still given to her after she got married, which is unlikely. So it's just one of those things that gets Chinese whispered down the line. Now, that, this is where it gets confusing. So, the name Joseph is the same. It refers to John the Baptist who travelled from 
Mesopotamia, but also Ptolemy Mesopotamia, who was also the king of that land as well, but also Jesus, who was the son of God. So Ptolemy Mesopotamia, who's Joseph, is described as being a descendant of the house of David, which he is because he's he's related to King Jubba and Cleopatra Selene. Um, so he is a member of House of David also. So that part fits as well. So we get quite, again, it, it is quite a complex subject. We have to know about symbology, but you also have to understand about individuals at the time. Now, we also have to recognize as well about the star leading to Bethlehem and the three wise men. Now, at this time, the star represents Judaism, which is the people, the new nation that is being in Bethlehem, which is this town of Gimel. And there's a reason why it's called Bethlehem. We're not going to go into it in this video, but it's, it's, it's all to do with name, and the name represents in the different language, again, to do with um, Mary, um, Cleopatra, and, and the Queen of Egypt, and the Queen of the Heavens, and the stars, which is, again, the thing. But remember, the Star of David is the Judaism symbol. So the three wise men go to the place where the star leads them, which is the new home of the Jews, which is this location. Now the three wise men, there's two parts to this because again they represent two things just like everybody else does. The three wise men is one, the head of the temple of Alexandria, two, the head of the temple of Edfu, and three, the temple of, head of the temple of Heliopolis. So the three wise men are the three heads of the three temples that travel to this place to see the birth of the king, the birth of the civilization. And with them they bring great knowledge and gifts, frankincense, myrrh, etc. And these are parts of the incense and the thing that we use parts of the king making ritual. So the gifts they give is the king making ritual to the new king to bless him as the king above kings, the kings of all. Um, which he uses the kingmaker ritual, so they come to teach him the kingmaking ritual. But they also pass on the knowledge to John the Baptist because he has the same knowledge, because he is the new king of that area. So they actually come twice. They come once to bless John the Baptist, the new king, when he arrives, and the new people, and a second time at the king of the birth of Jesus. And the three wise men represent Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes three times great, because the, whole, the Corpus Hermeticum was made and written and given to somebody at this time, which was John the Baptist, as we've described in that last video. So that's what the three wise men are, is the three members of the temple, but it also means the passing of knowledge from Hermes Trismegistus, the Corpus Hermeticum given to John the Baptist, and also later Jesus. Now, when we look at the idea of the king above kings, the ultimate emperor, the son of God, it's because he is the bloodline of gods, the pharaohs, the Hyksos kings, the Atanis, Akhenaten, Toth, all these people. All these bloodlines are connected to make him the ultimate kind of unified bloodline of all the above. And so he takes the title, just like demigods we've seen before, um, of the son of God. And so it all fits into place. Now the thing is, the problem is here, that he is the ultimate rule of the king that was promised to lead the Jews into a new world because, yes, he's the king of the Jews, but it's actually the Essene, he's the Essene, he's part of Nazarene, and those of the Mount Carmel society, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, but because of the bloodlines he has, he is technically the rightful ruler and descendant of this location that they've just been given, which it's called Bethlehem, but it's not on the map. It's Gimal. Um, Israel, because it's the Judaism, is the descendant of the house of David. Egypt, because he's the descendants of Cleopatra. He also has entitlement to Carthage and Africa through Jubba. He's also related... He, he's technically the rightful throne of Greece because of um, Cleopatra, Ptolemy and Alexandria. He's a descendant of Julius Caesar through Mia Fia Musa Arania. So technically his bloodline is even greater than Octavius's at this point. And so 
he becomes technically the rightful ruler of the Roman Empire also, and Parthia. So technically, Jesus, King Jesus, Ben Joseph, King Isis, that marries Mary Magdalene, rules the world, and all the Jews within it, and he is the rightful ruler and the king of the Jews. Now, you might say, well, what about this, that, and the other, and later series? We're not got to that bit yet. We're going to look at that individually, and we're just looking at the beginnings. This is his origin story, the events that come up to this, and that's what this video is for. Before we start getting ahead of ourselves, we will look at things like the crucifixion and all this sort of stuff after, because it's still important, but it'll just be in the life of that individual rather than this video as a whole. I'm not trying to make a video on the truth of the Bible or whatever. I'm trying to paint a picture, a skeletal frame of the genealogy of the people at that time to establish a reason that the information that we have been given all is in use and, uh, and established and is passed on in the way that it is and how it relates to the people at the time and the evolutions of the civilizations and the reason other events are happen in the political side of things. So that's where we're going to leave it for now. It's an extremely complex subject, and I can't possibly answer everything in one small video, but I've done my best to kind of get all the key points in. If you want to look at more information about some of this, it's not... Nobody has one answer. Everything is split into parts, because nobody's really looked at the whole thing. Um, but if you look at, let's say, um, about the eons with David Hancock, if you look at the... Um, uh, the, the symbolic connotations and kind of the, the more factual side it gets very long winded but it's extremely good at what they do in, in Ralph Ellis with all the different um, parts of this it describes the creation of Mount um, of, of Gimal and the movement and the migration from Parthia quite well but then there's also a lot of information about the life and times of that area itself by Spencer H. Lewis and those are the three kind of things I would advise you to kind of look at and expand upon but then there's also other stuff as well um, when you look at all the different gospels but again that's all stuff from written after the fact about it uh, so we try to look at the things before it or around that time to create the idea rather than the stuff after it looking in if that makes sense but yeah definitely check those out um, if you've got the time if not obviously you know and again this can be kind of contradictory so if you're not happy with that it doesn't matter leave a comment what you think um, there'll be a lot of people out there that don't agree don't like this idea but actually it's surely it's better to know a more accurate likely cause of events than something that's been written 500 years later than to sim simplify the context of what happened so we'll leave you with that for now so thank you very much take care goodbye hello again and welcome to the universal blueprint channel where we are looking at our sacred history now we've reached a pivotal point in our timeline and it's it's interesting for me because it's one one step or a couple of generations in the grand scheme of everything we've already looked at. We've already looked at hundreds of generations and individuals that uh, are part of the line and we will look at hundreds more. But it's just this singular section in our history timeline that creates so much confusion and controversy. And unfortunately that confusion and controversy has rippled out 